for today. Okay. Well, maybe we'll have Tammy's question just because I want to do the meditation and if people arrive, they miss the beginning. Maybe they won't arrive, but in case they do. So let's first hear Tammy's question. Tammy, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I think you might have an answered it uh, during uh, oh. the last session, but I'll just ask it anyway. Oh, okay. I'm not sure if I understood everything yeah. you said. So when we were talking about our inevitable grasping at existence at the moment of our death, mm -hmm. I was asking myself, how do the habits and imprints also influence the way we die? Do yeah. we die properly, don't we also need the right karmic seeds? And if we don't succeed in developing them, won't we always be thrown into the next life because the karmic seed will always ripen? As long as we're not liberated... Well, there is a state as a bodhisattva on a certain level who's not liberated yet, but this bodhisattva can, contr can control his or her rebirth. But leaving aside this kind of case of a bodhisattva, well, as ordinary people, as long as we're not liberated, um, we will always die um, as a result of grasping, well, we will always die anyway, and then we reborn in samsara as a result of craving and grasping or attachment and grasping. It will always take place. But um, in other words, we'll always be reborn in samsara. But the, the good news is that there are two types of rebirth. And if we create the right kind of causes and conditions, we'll be reborn in a happier state in samsara. Okay, so human or, or celestial realm. And that's what we're aiming for because we have more freedoms, more opportunities in these states. Now, attachment and grasping will be there and they will lead to the ripening of these imprints. However, there are other aspects, of course. These are not the only causes and conditions um, that are responsible for a particular rebirth. If, and it's true, if we don't accustom ourselves to certain states of mind, so to die with the compassionate, like the best case scenario, to have the, the, the best kind of rebirth, if you like, because it's not, we shouldn't forget, we, it, it's not just throwing karma that ripens at the time of our death, it's also other karmas that ripen. And if you're interested in practicing the Dharma, um, then to not just be born human, but to be also born human with all the causes and conditions that enable you to continue your Dharma practice. So that means being born with certain freedoms, with certain opportunities, etc. And all this, if, it, if we practice in this lifetime and we accumulate the causes and conditions throughout our life, well, we're very likely to generate the right kinds of mind that are uh, helping us, assisting us in that process of uh, generate, well, in that process of dying peacefully and in that way a posit for positive karmas to ripen, that although we're reborn in samsara, but it's a positive kind of rebirth that enables us to continue in our, uh, well, in our effort to attain liberation and of course enlightenment right so like i'm saying it's almost like you're ordering something online where our behavior is like placing the order okay our actions on a daily basis they determine what happens to us in the future they determine the state of mind at death but of course they also leave the right kind of imprints such that in the future we'll have more freedoms, more opportunities, in particular to free our mind um, from what is unwanted. Okay, so yeah, absolutely, our whole life. This is why I keep stressing this, particularly on Sunday uh, when I teach this class on Chandrakirti's text. Of course, it's all about wisdom, and we've just started to get, get into the really difficult aspects, but to not ignore bodhicitta, these positive states of mind which have such a positive effect on our mind, if we just practice them and we do the experience, the bodhicitta experience, if you like, however fake it is, 
to bring this into our daily lives. I mean, his homeless stresses this over and over and over again during every teaching his homeless gives. He stresses the importance of bodhicitta on one hand and of course involving our mind that is getting getting kind of um, reflecting on, contemplating on emptiness. But I guess if one of those is even more important, if you had to choose between the two, it would be bodhicitta. Okay, so important. Anyway, so let's do a meditation on what we've learned so far. And on that to deepen your understanding, deepen, uh, well, the sense of how this takes place, deepen your understanding of the 12 links, and then we'll continue with class. Um, yeah, so now we're 32 people. I think that's probably um, it for now. And we can start the meditation. As before, we'll start with some breathing. And then I'll just guide you through the meditation. to reflect on what you've learned so far about the 12 links. Think that you've accumulated a non-virtuous type of karma. That is forceful enough to throw you into Rebirth as an animal. So what gave rise to that negative action? It was the basic misapprehension or the ignorance that wrongly perceives of an intrinsic I. Objective self. And an objective world outside of ourselves. giving rise to other afflictions such as attachment to the eye, attachment to other objects, and a whole variety of
the other different emotions such as anger, jealousy. So most of our actions of body, speech and mind from moment to moment are influenced by this basic misapprehension and all the other afflictive emotions. Take a moment to check whether that's true in your own case. Are you aware of the presence of strong attachment towards I and mine? Attachment, which then gives rise or influences, which affects our actions of the mind, the speech, and the body. And again, check whether. This is true in your own case, that your mental, verbal, and physical actions are affected by attachment. Attachment towards I and that which is mine. And none of these actions getting lost, but are left on our mental consciousness in the form of karmic imprints. Giving rise to desirable effects and undesirable effects. Pleasant experiences, unpleasant ones, and neutral ones. So now, returning to the example of a throwing karma you've accumulated there potentially throws you into the animal realm. Even when you die in this lifetime, and due to a different karma,
you'll be again born in the human realm. This karmic seed remains on your mind. This karmic seed that potentially throws you into the animal realm is part of the causal consciousness of the present life and the resultant consciousness of the next life as a human being. And at the time of death in this life, your mind, your mental consciousness leaves your body holding that seat, enters into the pardo holding the same seat, And it enters the fertilized egg of your future human mother. Giving rise to name and form. which is the moment you have a new physical basis, form, and the other mental aggregates which are described as name Before the sense sources of the sense power, before they have started to grow. And then just as they're they are about to be ready, the six sense sources are ready to be used. You experience the next link, the link of the six sense sources. When they're not yet ready to make contact. With your mind still holding the karmic seat that potentially throws you into an animal rebirth. And once the six sense powers are now fully functioning, all six sense, all six consciousnesses, the five sense consciousnesses and the mental consciousness can now make contact. With any type of object.
giving rise to pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feelings. In fact, every time we make contact, or in other words, we apprehend an object, there's either a pleasant feeling, an unpleasant feeling, or a neutral feeling. And due to our habituation with anger, attachment and ignorance, three types of feelings give rise to one of those afflictive emotions. When we experience a pleasant feeling, it gives rise to attachment, If we experience an unpleasant feeling, it gives rise to resentment or anger. And in the case of a neutral feeling, it induces or strengthens the misapprehension of reality or any other type of ignorance. But in particular, what we're interested in as part of our understanding of what happens to the karmic imprint that can potentially give rise to an animal bath. We're talking of feeling here as part of the feeling that arises at the time of death. Death and the second human bath we've taken with a karmic seed still laying there its potential form. Our mind becomes aware of our impending death giving rise to a feeling of possibly dread, fear,
inducing attachment, strong attachment to I and the existence of the I. Craving towards the existence of the I. Which due to the process of death continuing grows stronger, grows into grasping. holding on to the I, the existence of the I. Which then gives rise to the next link, existence. When now the karmic seat has ripened. To such a degree that there's no going back. And a moment later, our mind will leave this body. And is first thrown into the powder state of an animal. And thereafter, to the birth as an animal. Experiencing sickness and aging as an animal. And eventually death all over again. The new seed ripening due to attachment and grasping at the time of death, and so on. Continuously creating new karmic seats and uncontrollably experiencing their results over and over again. unless we put an end to it. And now in conclusion, whatever insight you've reached, 
without analyzing, just single-pointedly focus on that insight or conclusion that you've come to and allow this to sink deeper into your mental consciousness. To a degree that your insight may affect your action, body, speech, and mind. Okay, now slowly rise from your meditation. All right, so this is actually just a course explanation of the 12 links. Um, well, actually, this is just how it all happens. And of course, there's also a reverse version, how we undo this. And we'll have to explain that and bring in the Mahayana, of course, as well. So we've got plenty to do next week. But just to explain to you the 12 again on the basis of the drawing we have, if we can go back to this drawing of the, um, the Wheel of Life. Go back to that, just to have an understanding of the coarser kind of process. Okay. Yes, there we are. All right. Now, again, to go to the center, to start with the center, we've already had. This describes, of course, ignorance, the pig, then the rooster and the snake, and of course, the representative, the representative of all the other afflictive emotions. Then leading to actions of body, speech, and mind. Of course, the white part is virtuous actions of body, speech, and mind. The left part of the first rim, uh, negative um, actions of body, speech, and mind, which then determine rebirth in one of those states. Now, those are just very coarse drawings of them. And, um, well, again, it's something to reflect on, and we'll do this next time to also allow the possibility if there is no subjective world if sorry if there's no objective world if everything is subjective then implied by that of course is that even the environment the way we perceive it as human is very different to what animals perceive for that matter and again very different to what beings in other realms experience now, sometimes this, the texts seem to suggest that these places are located elsewhere, but there's also plenty of uh, scriptural evidence or uh, descriptions of beings who are aware of these other realms who describe that you don't need to go to a different place, that actually what we perceive as a human existence with our senses, with our mind, other beings with different sense awarenesses perceive as a hellish type of place. And of course, the classic examples of that are that is, for instance, when you, in, in, in particular as part of the Madhyamika, or the middle way explanation of emptiness, when you have the example, it's usually given in the context of explaining emptiness, the example of a bowl of liquid. When three beings perceive this simultaneously, so it's a, some liquid, whether it's a bowl or whatever, it's some liquid there. If you're a human being, you experience it as water, what we ordinarily call water in the human realm, while a preta being would experience it as pus and blood, and a celestial being as nectar, 
So these are the different experiences. It describes the fact that it's totally subjective in that, and it's not always the case that when we experience liquid, another being perceives something else. Um, however, with regard to this example, it is possible you have a bowl of liquid, you have some liquid there, bowl or whatever, and a human perceives it as water and different beings perceive it differently. So in that sense, there can be similar experiences in that it's liquid, but determined by the karmic imprints a person, the karmic imprints a person has, it is still experienced differently. But since there is no explanation of a different basis implied by that, from, from the point of view of the location, even in the same place, what we would ordinarily describe as the same place, you can have different living beings. So in the room you're in right now, other realms exist at the same time, but we're not aware of each other's existence due to the fact that our reality is an expression of our karmic imprints. It is totally subjective. And because we have a karmic connection with other humans, we may have similar experiences, which is another word for saying we have, um, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? Common karma. No, there's a term for it. I forget right now. What's the word? Group karma. No. Collective. Collective. That's right. Thank you. Collective karma. So uh, right now, as we're all sitting here, uh, thinking of, reflecting on the, the, the 12 links, we have the collective karma in this situation to experience something similar. Again, it's similar, not exactly, not identical. There's something we have in common and we describe that as collective karma. And then as the time we spend together here online is over and we go about our own business, individual karmas, they're different from each other. Of course, we're ripen again. In fact, in each moment, different karmas ripen and we accumulate new ones. And so that accounts for so many different experiences. But when our experiences are so different that we can no longer communicate as ordinary beings, then you have these different realms. Okay, so just saying different subjective experiences and the way they're depicted here, those are just symbolic. Um, of course, the human realm that you can see, remember I said it's like two o'clock and 2.30, it's that area that would, if you had a clock, it would be like two o'clock and 2.30, that area there, that's the human realm. Well, yeah, that looks like um, there you have houses and tents for the nomads and the guys sitting in the house and it's basically like well the way we live in the human realm we have our own home we go to work well in the modern world we have cars we have certain modes of transportation here this is very traditional the way the human realm is described here um, and then if you go to the other side that's kind of like 7 30 to 8 30 um, there you have like the animal realm, you see an ocean, you see water, elephants, I don't know, horses and so forth. Um, and then the celestial realms, again, there's a house, there's like, you have the, the semi-celestial beings like in that building and then the celestial, a higher kind of celestial beings that have even more pleasure, uh, exactly where the little thing is right now pointing at, right, on that above the tree this 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 wish fulfilling tree and so forth now how literally this all is the way it's described i don't know but it's just states where you have a lot less suffering than you have as humans um you have different bodies you don't have a body that gets smelly and that you have to shower all the time it's still very limited, but it's interesting when you hear the accounts of these realms where people don't have to work as hard, they don't have the problems we have. It's like typical human problems um, where there's no way, however hard you wish for it, however many clothes you buy, etc., at eventually you'll be bored of buying these clothes. You, how many cars you buy, you'll get bored of them. Um, you always have sufferings, no matter how positive your circumstances. There's a certain amount of suffering that you have in the human realm that you don't have in the celestial realm. 
very interesting if you understand that. And it's also very helpful to stop trying to find happiness in places where it cannot be found. Spending so much time and energy and never finding the happiness we're looking for. That is the external um, aspects of, of the human life, for instance. Perceiving it for what it is. Anyway, so we could talk more about it and we will, but just roughly that explains the different realms, which in turn were created by the different karmas in the fast rim. And what is that process? The process is described in the outermost rim. So the 12 links are here depicted uh, by these, these pictures. So I'll just roughly explain them. Like I'm saying, this is just a course kind of overview and there are more details uh, but I find it's easier to give you an overview before going into the details. Now, if we could zoom into the part where the fangs of this weird monster that's holding the twelve, the the wheel of life, it's, it's going to be explained what that monster refers to. Um, if we could zoom into where the the right fang is located, if we could zoom into that picture. Yep, a little bit, oh yeah, we, we don't see, a little bit up because you can see a guy who's blind um, with a stick. If you could see that guy. Oh, there he goes. Yes, so there's this this elderly person. That's like between 12 and 1 o'clock of this picture. So you see an elderly person holding a stick and this person is blind. So like a blind old person, that is our ignorance as in like our misapprehension of reality it's kind of symbolic here this elderly person with someone showing them the way we need others to show us the way in other words because of our misapprehension of reality so just as when you reach a certain age um, your mind no longer perceives things as clearly as you used to well similarly our misapprehension it perceives something but the mode of existence, the way things exist, that is no longer perceived correctly. And therefore, just as a blind person can uh, potentially hurt him or herself if they stumble due to not being able to perceive things as they are, sights and sounds, etc. Similarly, we can hurt ourselves. Um, and that is then described in which way do we hurt ourselves when, when you look at the next picture you see a person it's a potter it's someone creating pots forming pots that is our own mind influenced by our misapprehension which then once we have this misapprehension they will automatically there's just no way around it if you have the misapprehension of reality there will be attachment to the eye and if there's attachment to the eye there's attachment to other objects and likewise, there are other afflictive emotions that arise and that, that which then influence our behavior. And that behavior is like a potter. Our behavior, it mainly comes from the mind. So here, the emphasis you, you, you hear is so much on the mind, although they're actions of speech and body, but they're all volitional actions, which means we're not talking about reflexes that are not uh, directed by the mind, but we're talking in particular about the actions directed by the mind. So these mental events that have to be present in order for acts such as insulting someone or praising someone, killing someone or saving someone's life to take place. So we're forming our future, our actions of body, speech and mind. So the potter skill is the effect of ignorance and attachment. So it's affected by that. And then there are objects that lead to pots that lead to suffering and pots that lead to uh, happiness in that sense. All right. And that, then what is, what is created by the mind, these actions, they're left on the mind. And that's the next picture of a monkey on an apple tree. Now, this is the consciousness. This is the consciousness that now holds the imprint of the action, 
holds the imprints of these different actions that we formed. So they were formed by the mind and now they're left on the mind. And the mind, since the mind is like a monkey in that sense, so the drawing here is that of a wild monkey that is after fruits. It's this craving mind, our mind that's just basically it's it's an attached craving mind. Our mind is, 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 that's its function very much, one of its functions, one of its functions that harms us. And based on that mind, that's like a monkey, this karmic seed is left. This karmic seed is left on the mind. Oh gosh, the cat just came in. Um, anyway, so that is left on the mind. And then if we can see the next drawing, we can see the next drawing. The next drawing is that of a boat. You see a boat and people inside the boat. Now that is name and form. Name and form in the sense that the body here, of course, you've heard it's the body. Um, it's the body at the time of conception in the new life. And that body now holds the mind. It holds the, the other states of mind, or that is the other aggregates. Sorry, I just throw out the cat. So um, the boat is the body at the time of conception. That's really the, 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 the fertilized egg. And then the mind, that is part of it. That has just entered that um, sorry, I'm so distracted by the cat. Um, that is so the 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 body being this boat is like the the cell the the cells that are that start to divide up, and then part of that is the mind, or the other mental aggregates. Then giving rise to the next, you see the next picture, that is the picture of a house which is an empty house. It's an empty house in that those windows are the sense sources, but it's not clear, but in the explanations that it's explained that it's an empty building. Sorry, the cat is making so much noise. Sorry, I just have to throw out the cat because um, usually I lock the door, but this time I couldn't lock it. Sorry, I just need to throw out the cat, just a sec. Usually I lock the door. This cat can actually open the, the doors. Um, okay. So now you have this house with this um, empty, it's an empty building and described in the, in the commentaries, you have a description of this building being empty as in like the sense sources. Now they're there just before they're fully functioning. So it's like an empty house, as in like the different windows represent the different sense organs or the different sense sources, sense powers that are about to be fully active. Okay, they're not yet active. But then there is contact. Contact, you see the next drawing. Yep, right there. Um, that is contact. And here it's described between a man and a woman, okay? So contact between two living beings. Now here contact is more in the sense of our mind makes contact with objects like sense objects, mainly our life is very much governed by perceiving sense objects. And of course, giving rise to attachment, uh, craving for these sense objects. Now making contact with these objects, and that is described here by there's two people having contact, a man and a woman in this case, I believe. I think I can't see it clearly, but I remember from the explanation. And then that gives rise to feeling. Feeling is um, shown in the form of an, of a, uh, an arrow, 
meeting like hitting the eye which is like the worst type of pain so here feeling our feeling the feeling we experience is said to be now this is really important this describes also feeling in the sense that it's in the nature of suffering our feeling is in the nature of suffering in that even what we experience even what we consider to be pleasant feeling a feeling of pleasant a pleasure that which we crave that is also in the nature of suffering in the sense that it's it's not actual pleasure there's our mind has the potential to experience the most amazing pleasure pleasure that is totally free from any kind of worry about i and mine and about losing that pleasure it is pure pure pleasure which right now we just cannot experience what we experience what we call pleasure right now is merely the absence of a worse type of experience what we call un displeasure which is why for instance after you were sick like usually when we're not sick when we're well there's no just ordinarily we're not happy that we are healthy at all we're not happy that we're healthy there's no sense of happiness however when you were sick for so just our daily feeling of for instance when you eat certain types of food if you eat a certain type of food it's kind of all right it's not really pleasant unpleasant it's it doesn't give you a huge pleasure so then when you were sick for a long time and you couldn't have that kind of food and you eat it for the first time there's great pleasure well why is there this kind of pleasure and it wasn't there before because there was a worse type of suffering before that there was the suffering of the sickness and now because that stopped that first moment just after you were sick and now you can do the do the things again you couldn't do before it gives rise to this great pleasure only because a worse type of suffering stopped and then as a result of that there's more pleasure but when you don't have that great suffering and that suddenly stops then you wouldn't have that kind of pleasure why because the things in and of themselves are not pleasurable at all that is you cannot we cannot with the mind we have right now we cannot experience the kind of pleasure we could potentially experience if we've removed the mis misapprehension of reality all our experiences are always a type of suffering except that the time when there are lesser problems there in comparison to a worse trouble that we call pleasant that we call pleasant the classical example i gave you the example of the sickness but of course for instance when you experience strong cold when it's really really cold if you go into a place where it's really really hot or maybe give you another example because that's very physical if you're in a place where it always rains it always rains okay it doesn't physically affect you you're in a house inside you don't get wet but when it always rains after a while you experience this rain as unpleasant and then the sun shines and that first experience of the sun shining outside seems to be so ple pleasant but then if every day if every day the sun is shining is shining is shining is shining at some point you get so sick of just seeing the sun every day and you crave something else it's just normal it's no longer pleasant in fact the sun is burning things possibly and so forth there's no rain but even without that you the first time you experience rain again now there is the happiness of having rain and this is true for every experience whatever experience there is if it's continuously going on it will sooner or later become suffering and it's the change that brings about happiness we need change to experience happiness from moment to moment if every experience were always the same we always ate the same food we were always the same people we would suffer this change is necessary because sooner or later any experience in samsara will turn into suffering and we need to change that worth suffering and experience happiness in its place and that's why every feeling even pleasant feeling neutral feelings are actually in comparison to the happiness of a person who's freed him or herself from ignorance is like having an error in your 
in your eye, which is about the worst we could think of, the worst kind of uh, feeling. So that's really, really important. And because of this, it also gives rise, this kind of limited feeling, it gives rise to attachment and craving well attachment in the case of a pleasant feeling anger in the case of a in the case of an unpleasant feeling and ignorance in the case of a neutral feeling why because these emotions they're not pure and they always give rise to to the afflictions in one way or another then that in turn this feeling, so giving rise to attachment in particular at the time of death, that's what we're interested in because we're still following the seat. That gives rise to attachment, to craving. And this is here in the case of alcohol. So here they show a person who um, is drinking alcohol, having that addiction. So addiction to the eye, attachment to the eye, attachment to the existence of the eye, craving for the existence of the eye at the time of death, in particular, when we have this feeling, I am disappearing because mind and body are separating. So that which we identify with, with the body in particular, we feel how the mind is now moving away from it. And this feeling, I'm, I'm going out of existence, which is not true, but that's just this um, wrong, wrong kind of sense we get of what's happening. Therefore, we crave in particular existence strengthening to such a degree that there's grasping, holding on. So this is here depicted by a person grasping at apples to take them, to hold on to them, holding on to an apple. So holding on to existence, trying to hold on to existence here um, in the form of um, holding on to apples. Then that gives rise to the ripening of this karmic imprints. So in other words, giving rise to a new existence in the case of the animal birth, giving rise to a new existence as an animal. And here it's the two people uh, in the sexual union basically giving rise. To, uh, previously, like the contact was just touching between men and women. Here, and this is unrelated to contact, it's just a different kind of analogy for what's happening. So um, a man and a woman having sexual uh, contact, uh, contact or having being in a sexual union, which gives rise to the pregnancy of the, of the, 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 the woman and therefore to birth. So this is just saying when this karmic seed has ripened, when you have existence, which is just this germinated seed, then a moment later, you have the pardo and then you have birth. And here you see a woman actually giving birth. But birth doesn't literally mean giving birth, uh, being born from a mother's womb. It also refers to conception. But since the Tibetan word, the Tibetan word has both meanings. It means conception as well as birth from the womb. So it's one word. And depending on the context, you know what they're talking about. So here, since conception is very difficult, well, at, at the time anyway, when these drawings came into existence, um, they they didn't really know what this, this um, fertilized egg looked like. And anyway, why would you put a fertilized egg in a, in a drawing? So they put the drawing of a woman giving birth. That's a birth. And then, of course, there's old age, sickness and death and that's all well it's kind of like this person carrying a corpse you see the person carrying a corpse it's like we're carrying around our body it's like carrying around a corpse we're carrying around something it's the last picture between 11 and 12 so you see a corpse actually lying there next to the stupa on the right with like vultures uh, eating it. Well, that's the way a course was um, taken care of in Tibet. It was fed to the vultures. But even before that, that's part of aging, sickness and aging. You see to the left, this guy has got like a rope bound around his body, carrying a corpse, actually. And carrying a corpse, that's when we're still alive. We're carrying this body, which is on its way to die. Our body is basically on its way to to lose its life. So we're moving towards death. So sometimes in the scriptures, it's like saying we're carrying a corpse. In some of the texts, it's actually talking about carrying around this corpse, saying that, well, sooner or later, this body we're so attached to will desert us, will, well, leave us, leave us to be, as in like it will no longer function as our body because it will 
decay, well, die and then decay. I'll be separate from our mind and then decay. So that's old age. And of course, sickness is part of that. We're aging, not just when we're old, but even from the moment we were born to then die. Okay, so that's the picture just explaining giving you a rough explanation and of course it's in the mouth of a monster here and his holiness the Dalai Lama this is the drawing that of course um, we've used that Jadu Rinpoche has given the instructions for so here the monster is this it's it's death it's actually uh, it's symbolic for death his holiness the Dalai Lama has also recommended um, to draw uh, a skeleton so in some drawings, you see the Lord of Death and in some drawings, a skeleton. So that's just a different way of looking at it. The skeleton, of course, being representative for death. The Lord of Death, it's called the Lord of Death. There's no Lord of Death. It's just symbolic. There's no actual being called the Lord of Death. There are said to be beings, but that's different. It's not, it's not like there's a being that is responsible for our death. So there is no Lord as death as such, but it's called that because the, the one thing we that really controls us, that can take away anything from us is death. In that if there was this powerful Lord, I mean, if there was a powerful king, for instance, who could take away everything for, from us, well, taking away our worldly possessions and so forth, that's possible. Um, but really, death is that which takes everything away. So more so, of course, a king could kill us, yes. But really, death is the one thing that once it's there, once we have the karma to die, there's nothing that can stop death uh, from separating mind and body. In that sense, it's like this really powerful being. That's how it's explained usually. All right, now those are... The 12 links, as I said, in a rough kind of form. We've done a little bit of meditation on them, but of course, more detail is necessary to go more into detail on, well, the misperception. To give you more details on that, on its functions. To give you more detail on the afflictive emotions in general, because that was pretty coarse but what else gives rise to them we have not mentioned certain factors such as the exaggerating uh, mental factors and so forth or the exaggerated exaggerating attitude as it's called i've given already some explanation um, of the karmic imprints but a little bit more on that um, and of course uh, on the rest of it okay so having more details and bringing bringing in the Mahayana, because what does this describe here? Well, if you think of the Lamrim, and also extremely important, whatever you learn, whatever Buddhist study you do, you need to be able to place it into the Lamrim. So again, he stresses this a lot and he stresses this only because his own teachers have stressed this a lot. His own teacher, like his holiness, the Dalai Lama and his own teacher, well, Geshe, Geshe, Geshe Nima Top um, or Shao Kerumbuchi, these amazing teachers he had, we are usually not familiar with them. I mean, I heard their names. For instance, Shao Kerumbuchi, he had already passed away when I started my, my uh, education as well, when I became a nun. Anyway, those were these amazing teachers, amazing, amazing teachers. And I'll say a little bit about them, but the point is they've always stressed the importance of whatever you learn, Whatever you study as part of the Dharma, you need to be able to bring it back to the Lamrim. Why? Because the Lamrim, those teachings, they help you to understand the process of getting from, well, being an ordinary being to becoming, of course, fully enlightened. It's a very convenient way to describe the stages of the path. And it allows you, once you have an understanding of the Lamrim, you also understand that everything you study is actually part of the Lamrim and therefore like a personal instruction. But the Lamrim is very obvious how it is a practice instruction, how it teaches you exactly how you should live your life, how the Dharma is to be applied. But that's not always that 
obvious with certain ideas in the Dharma, they're so complex, they're so tough, they're so difficult to understand, that it's really difficult to place them. This is part of learning the Dharma. It's not just about understanding the facts, but also being able to place everything you learn in a certain order, as in like, what is this part of? Is this part of the um, the the different teachings um, of a person of smaller uh, spiritual capacity, of middling spiritual capacity, or of greater spiritual capacity? In other words, are these part of the teachings that mainly cause us to be reborn in a higher rebirth within samsara? Are those parts of the teachings that are mainly geared towards attaining liberation? Or are those parts of the teachings that are mainly geared towards becoming fully enlightened? Okay. So, therefore, whatever you learn, I'm sure most of you have a basic understanding of the Lam Rim. Um, if you don't, well, you should make an effort to gain that kind of basic knowledge. And then whatever you learn, try to place it into one of the Lam Rim teachings. And in that way, you're able to see all the teachings as personal instructions. And again, it's so important to bring the Dharma into your daily life in that way. And to say something about these great scholars, oftentimes there are two types of great scholars in the Buddhist tradition. In particular, in the Gilok tradition, where there is great emphasis on study. There are actually two types. This is my kind of sense uh, I developed over the years with everything I've heard from my teachers. There are those who have incredible knowledge of all the details of what is in every text, what it says in every text, all the details, the nitty gritty details. And that is invaluable. That's an incredibly precious understanding, of course, because all the scriptures are advice. There's their, their personal advice in general can be taken that way. And if someone has knowledge of all of that, that is so valuable because you they're like a like a like a encyclope encyclopedia, like a walking encyclope encyclopedia, and you can't always find them in the text, but you can always ask that person. So in terms of just getting the information, incredible knowledge. That is one side, now these practitioners or these scholars, and there are those who have lesser knowledge of these nitty gritty details, because it's a lot about reading this, reading that, but who take the essence of these teachings and have a very deep understanding of them. There are, of course, some who have both. There are some, and they're extremely rare, because the first requires a lot of time where you read all the text and great memory to retain everything you read. And the second requires incredible deep reflection. And there are some who have both, but it's very difficult to find people who have both. And which one, of course, is more valuable? The second. It's not so much about nitty gritty details. That's great and that's admirable. But even more important is these greater detail, well, this deeper knowledge. And the good news is you yourself, you can come to the second one easier in your circumstances. And I said early on, the way to do this is take some time off every day, read a few pages of a book or listen to a teaching for some time. And the main points that you've learned, note them down if you need to, if you can remember them anyway, they are your object of reflection for the day. As Dichit of the Pesach described it. And then wherever you go, whatever you do, how much time we spend daydreaming. I mean, really, hours and hours. And sometimes it's good to daydream. It relaxes the mind. If we're uptight previously, yes, we become more relaxed. We, we allow the mind to, just run, mind to just run wild. But to the extent it often does, I don't think it's necessary. Now, as I said early on, if you can't make time to meditate and anyway, it's uncomfortable and you sit there cross-legged and well, if you can make time, that's perfect to have this daily discipline. But on top of that, I'm saying even on top of that, take some aspect every day. And if it's the Lam Rim, great. But even then, anything you want to learn about, place it into anything that is part. So 
which which topic is it mainly part of? Is it part of bodhicitta? Is it part of emptiness? Is it part of precious human rebirth? Part of karma? It, in one way or another, is always part of something. And then reflect on that deeper, as, as deep as you can, as in like applying it to yourself, your own personal experience, and make it part of your own life. Make it part of your own life in that, first of all, your actions are now in accordance with what you've learned, but also your outlook with regard to the world. Let's say you take dependent arising. Okay, so dependent arising, if you take dependent arising, you reflect upon it, dependence on causes and conditions, right? Which is the 12 links as part of that causes and conditions. We'll get more into the 12 links as part of the uh, uh, dependent arising as part of this topic here. But let's say it's that topic. So it's part of dependent arising in terms of emptiness. It's part of the 12 links. That's also, you can kind of, uh, take it from that category so you can actually categorize it in different ways and then to think well where is dependent arising in my own life to recognize it first of all where is it at work and then see it in everything just look around and dependent arising is everywhere and you see the world through dependent arising. You watch a movie, you see dependent arising. You see a situation between two people, you see dependent arising. Dependent arising is everywhere. You see it because it's there. But usually no one has pointed it out to us. And so even when it pointed out to us, it makes perfect sense, but then we live our normal life. So turn dependent arising is over there with the Dharma people, with the Dharma friends. And then there's the normal life. But dependent arising is there the whole time. The Buddha just pointed it out to us. We're just incapable of perceiving it. Why? Because we hold on to things being so solid that means they're independently, this, that, and, and the rest of it. And so independence doesn't really work, which is why, and we'll talk more about emptiness and so forth next week, but dependent arising needs to come in and you start seeing it. Slowly, you start seeing dependent arising everywhere. Then subtle impermanence. You start seeing subtle impermanence everywhere. And suddenly, your daily experiences teach you the Dharma. Your life has become the Dharma in that you see it everywhere. And life teaches you the Dharma. And that's what we're trying to get to. So just as these great masters, and you can tell sometimes great Lamas, they use examples in everyday life. Like Gishtuf and Pesang is a great example. He sees the Dharma everywhere. And the examples he uses are daily, day-to-day -day kind of examples because he doesn't need examples of yaks and butter tea, the original ones that we refer to because, you know, we, we can't see the Dharma in everyday life yet. He sees it in everything and then applies it. So that should be our goal take a subject, as I said, that's the first step, as Gishtutam Pasang does in a very relaxed kind of setting. Maybe if you can discuss it with others, great. But even if it's not possible, it should not prevent you from doing this. Think about it, think about it, really make it your own until you see it in your own case, but you see it all around you. And then reality, the things around you, which are also called dharma, when we say dharma, dharma, the, the Sanskrit word means the Buddha dharma, but it's also another word for reality, which shows us that Buddhist philosophy is actually just showing us reality. So it's expressing it in a way so that we, we can see the dharma all around us. That is the way to go about it. And then your life becomes the dharma. It's it, You see the dharma, you live the dharma, and even though you go to work, you pay your insurance, you pay taxes, you drive a car, you have kids, you have a husband, whatever you have, all this becomes part of your dharma practice, in particular when your motivation is to become enlightened. When you do, as I just said, from the point of view of wisdom, what I just said was, is the aspect of wisdom. When you see the Dharma all around you, interdependence and all that, then you bring the wisdom aspect into your own life. That is the wisdom aspect. You see the Dharma in your own life. Here, this was more the aspect of wisdom, interdependence, emptiness, 
uh, impermanence and so forth. This is how you bring in the wisdom into your own life. And then bringing in, comp bringing in the emotional aspects, that's where you have to generate emotional states such as love and compassion. It's less about understanding, but more about generating them. Understanding is required, but it's not as deep as the understanding you need when it comes to emptiness and interdependence. You generate these states of mind and you see, there is the classic way where you, um, of course, meditate on them step by step. But I believe if you, and this is just part of an experiment, if you just, you go right away and you generate the wish to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, and you repeatedly do that, you're already leaving some imprints in the mind that makes it easier to really uh, develop heartfelt love and so forth. Okay, you're kind of like taking a step further. You're habituating the mind in that direction. When you have a problem, think welfare of other sentient beings is more important. It's fake when you first think it, but it's just, oh, okay, I don't need to be so worried about my problem because others' problems are a lot worse. They're a lot heavier and my responsibility is others. If you can really do that, even like in, in other cases, it's, it's almost like it's not how it's described, but it has an effect on the mind. Just remind yourself, okay, it's a personal problem, but other problems are worse. My goal should be other sentient beings. So then it's already easier to bear the problem. So you can kind of jump that step. Similarly, if, for instance, you find yourself to be envious of another person, well, the step, you could also take it slowly and that at some point you should, as in like, well, but the, the, the other person also deserves to be happy and they should be happy and so forth. Or you just force yourself to just rejoice in the other person's um, success. You literally, you just go, no, I'm so happy. You kind of start almost talking to yourself I'm so happy may that person be really doing well in what they're doing may they do better you kind of generate another type of mind the jealous mind is one type but you generate this mind may they be happy may they have happiness and both can't exist at the same time so you're actually kind of forcing your your envy out in that moment accustoming your mind to just thinking along those lines. And it's just how the mind works. It's just habits. Okay. Anyway, so you need to work with this yourself. Um, and this is just a suggestion how you go about it. And in the end, you are your own guru. It's your own. We talk about the internal guru. We take, we talk about taking refuge in our own wisdom. And it's just this process of getting in touch with that. Now, you can listen to these ideas, but in the end, you find your own way in which you can practice this. But of course, the guiding aspect is the lumbrum. Don't forget the lumbrum. Always bring everything back to the lumbrum. Okay, having said this, we've got 10 minutes left. I'd like to finish our meditation by meditating on the 12 links in a it's not all the 12 we will have more time to go more into this next time but in a coarser kind of way and now use them to generate compassion generating love and compassion for other sentient beings to understand we are caught in this being overwhelmed by attachment and so forth but so are others and i want you for this week this week is dedicated towards the 12 links I want you to, if you can, if you can, to remember again and again the 12 links as in like actions that you accumulate to become aware of the consequences they potentially could have and so forth. But also in terms of others, when you're with other people, if you can remember, remember other people's are caught in that state as well. And that, of course, goes along with compassion and bodhicitta. May I be able to help them to get out of this? Okay. So if we can do this, bring the 12 links into our life in the way I just described, then we have the 
we prepare ourselves in the best way for next week's class. Okay, great. So let's do some meditation on that. And it's mainly focused on others, love and compassion for others. And we'll finish then in one go with the dedicating the virtue of this, these last two days um, and do the prayer uh, at the very end. So I won't say anything further. All right, so let's spend a few moments. I'll add five minutes because those were taken off the last session. So allow me to add five minutes. So we have 15 minutes. Okay, so I'll be five minutes over time if that's okay. And if you need to go, feel free to leave during the meditation. Start with a little bit of breathing. Having reflected so far on our own life and our personal situation and a potential future situation, let's remember we're just one person. While there are countless other sentient beings with so many of them experiencing a lot worse a lot more misery than we experience right now Experiencing extreme cold or heat, hunger and thirst. fear and depression. Terrible physical illnesses or mental diseases. But what is worse than that is that they continuously create causes for new suffering. Not aware of the law of karma or simply not believing that actions have consequences.
not aware of the potential danger of ignorance, attachment, anger, and all the other afflictive emotions. creating karmic seats which due to their craving and grasping at the time of death throws them in different existences. Dying terrified and full of, full of anger, and thereby more likely to lead to the ripening of a non virtuous karmic seed. And even if they're reborn in a state with more freedom, such as the human state, spending all their life and all their energy racing after material progress, material objects, fame, praise, success, worldly success, never finding the satisfaction they're looking for. accumulating numerous non-virtuous actions, believing those to bring them happiness. seeing them no meaning in their own life, no way out. Experiencing fear, Depression, stress, loneliness, only to have to all give up everything they're attached to when they die. experience the terror
of death. Only to be reborn again and again and again. In states where they experience endless unwanted suffering. So compared to our own suffering, suffering of sentient beings is just in terms of numbers, so much worse. So let's generate a mind that sincerely wishes for all sentient beings to be free from all these sufferings and more importantly to be free from their misapprehension of reality. Since no one deserves to suffer But they do, due to this misapprehension. Let's generate this deep compassion that sincerely wishes for all sentient beings to be free from any type of limitation and that wishes may I be able to free all sentient beings from all their unwanted experiences and everything that causes those, in particular the misapprehension of reality. And then strengthen that wish such that it becomes the determination, I will do all I can to liberate sentient beings from all their unwanted experience and in particular of those causes such as the misperception of reality. I'll liberate them from all that. And lead them to a state of liberation. Or even Buddhahood. Since I can only do that if I become a Buddha myself first. Therefore, generate the mind that is determined to become enlightened for the welfare of all sentient beings. So that we can take sentient beings out of the 12 links.
And let's also dedicate now whatever virtue we've accumulated today and yesterday and will accumulate throughout the next few days applying this to our own life. Let's dedicate it towards our own enlightenment. And at the same time, also dedicate this virtue towards the well-being of sentient beings, even right now, as expressed by Shantideva's dedication prayer. May also reduce the suffering of this world right now. such as the suffering of disease. In the case of Tali Lubin, may she get better really soon. And everyone else who's sick and suffering right now. So with this mind, feeling this from the depth of your heart, let's recite the dedication prayer. Oh, okay. Well, we we'll do the Shanti Deva tomorrow then. Oh, okay. Let's do it today. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. Uh, can you put it up a little bit? Uh, may the naked find... You can scroll it up a little bit, David. Tomer. Oh, Tomer. Sorry, not David, Tomer. Just keep concentrating on your dedication. <laughs> Great, thank you. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. And most important, for as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, sorry, I went a little bit over time, so 10 minutes, but um, please don't forget your homework for this week, which is twice as much because of your homework um, for the Sunday class, but maybe you combine the two. And then I'll see you again if you have the time to be around. I'll see you again on Friday and Saturday to go into slightly more 
details and to bring in more of the Mayana teachings. Okay, great. Take care. Thank you very much, Geshema, for the okay. precious teaching. You're welcome. And also thank for uh, thank you, Vadala, for uh, oh yes um, for the for preparing the table, the course text, and as all the other volunteers. Uh, I remind you that all the classes are recorded on YouTube, um, and you can watch them in other classes as well. And finally, uh, if you wish to do so, you can uh, practice generosity and donate. Uh, in the event page on uh, DFI website. I'll just realize that um, that Michael Muller sent a, a question, and that's a very good question, but we don't have time to answer it now. So please, Michael, if you could, if he's still around, if you could please post it again next week. It's an important question. I didn't see it. Or maybe it can remain in the chat so I can read it next time. All okay. right. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tschüss, Adi. Goodbye. Thank you.